Good morning, everybody, and good afternoon, and I think even good evening. So uh, welcome. Good to have you with us. We appreciate you taking some time uh, to spend with us today as we look at trying to uncover some re-engagement strategies and looking at uh, the size of our databases and who we're talking to and who we're not talking to and maybe some suggestions on how we can uh, talk to a few more people and try and create some, uh, some more engagement. My name is Derek Bell. I'm your host for today. So I look after our marketing and customer success at Marketing Cube. On the line with us today to assist is Matt Hemsley, our marketing manager, and also Jason O'Donnell, one of our account directors. So Matt and Jason will be managing the Q&A for us. So if you do have questions throughout the, uh, the session, please go ahead and, uh, and use the Q&A function to do that. And of course, the session is being recorded as is always the case. So let's dive in and have a look at the agenda for today. So as, uh, as promised, uh, we're gonna go through some, some regular things to share with you. We'll cover that off in the introduction. Then we'll dive into today's subject matter, which is uncovering the less engaged contacts. Then looking at some re-engagement uh, strategy and tips to, to uh, obviously improve the engagement with those folks. And then also just have a quick look at the release 21A details. And of course, any Q&A at the end as well, always happy to stay on the line and have a chat. But the first thing we always do at the beginning of each session is have a look at some questions that may have been submitted by people as they registered. So first one is from Kelly in Melbourne. And Kelly wants to know, so essentially she wants to be able to know and test <clears throat> if new subscribers are getting put on the, that should be the correct segment list. So there's a few things at play here. So let's dive in and have a look at some answers to that particular question. So from Kelly's point of view, the, I know what Kelly's referring to. So on their website, uh, they'll have a couple of forms that people can uh, subscribe to the blog, for example. And so they're incentivized to fill in that particular form. And so the answer to the question relies heavily on the form processing step. So if we have the, the form processing steps configured to push people into the right email groups or subscribe them, to the right email group, well then when you build your segment, all you need to do is ask Ella to give you everybody that is actually subscribed to that particular email group. Now testing the process sometimes, especially if maybe you're new to Eloqua and Eloqua has been in the business for a while and you're just trying to understand the makeup of different campaigns and where a form on the website goes, you know, what happens to it when it goes into Eloqua, then sometimes using your own email address again and again can be a little bit problematic and does, it, does make it a little bit harder for you to have a unique experience. Because remember, it's impossible to have more than one email, sorry, more than, uh, or you can't repeat an email address in Eloqua. Okay, so they must be unique within the platform. So what we need is some way to create a unique email address. And the last thing you're probably going to want to do is create lots of free Gmail or Hotmail accounts or Yahoo accounts, et cetera. So there is a solution uh, to doing that. And we suggest that you create a Gmail account. And so I want to show you a little, uh, I don't know if I'd call this a life hack, but uh, maybe a digital marketing hack. So if you go ahead and create yourself a Gmail account, Probably don't use your own personal one because you don't want any access to that at work, but uh, just create one for testing and it might be your company name at gmail.com or it could be anything you want at gmail.com. So that gives you an inbox that you can use for testing. Now, what you can actually do is append that email address with a little bit of information exactly as you see between those two black lines there. So if you include the plus and then a unique value, that then creates a unique email address. And that's what Eloqua wants. Eloqua will then treat that as a brand new contact um, and it will go through relevant processes. But the nice thing for you from a testing point of view is that any email that is sent to that unique email address will simply go into your regular acme at gmail.com email inbox. So from a testing point of view, it makes it a lot easier because you can test multiple things at one time. So if you've got four or five different forms on the website and you're not really 100% sure which form they feed into and do they get an autoresponder email, et cetera, and those sorts of things, well, you can then create uh, some unique email addresses like this. Pretty simple process. Let me show you what I mean. 
So on our website, if you were to go to our event page, you'd be uh, looking at a range of different events and different things that are happening. But uh, essentially right at the very top of the page, we have a call to action to subscribe now. And so if I click on subscribe now and don't miss the next event, then you're taken to an eloquent landing page. So we leave WordPress and from WordPress, you then arrive here at this particular page. Now at Marketing Cube, our Marketing Cube email addresses are in fact Gmail addresses. So if I type in Derek and I do plus, um, what should I do? What's today? Today's the 23rd of Feb. I'll call it events. So I know that it was the event form that I submitted. Uh, so where in the world am I? I'm in Australia and I'm in New South Wales. How many contacts do I have? I have thousands. Probably wish I had more. I've opted in and so I subscribe. Now, what's happened there is uh, I've now essentially created a unique email address. Now, of course, I have to remember what that email address is. So if I now go straight into Eloqua, Derek plus 23, there it is, 23rd of February. So now I can open up. So this is the testing phase if we're trying to test. I can have a look and I can see the name of the email that I was sent. I was subscribed to future mailings, et cetera. And so all that information is visible and I can see it right there on my screen. So from a testing point of view, what I've done now is create a unique contact with an Eloqua and I can see exactly what happens to that particular person. Now it'll take a minute or so, but what you'll also see there is form submission. You're not seeing the actual form submission right away, but give it a few minutes and that activity will update as well. So that's probably one of the cleanest and easiest ways to, uh, to do your testing and to work out what it is that, uh, and, and where people go. If we look at the form, so this is the actual form that I just submitted from, uh, from Eloqua. So again, if I look at the form submission data, you can see Derek here, that's the unique email address that I just created. And if I wanted to be certain that Derek's actually being subscribed to the event subscription, I need to go to the processing steps and I can see here in the processing steps, there's a one called email group, subscribe, unsubscribe. And in this particular example, I wanna select subscribe. And so that's it. So I now know that Derek is subscribed to uh, the events area. And if I look at Derek's contact, specifically under preferences, you'll see that I'm subscribed with a date and time stamp as to when that took place. So that's the easiest way uh, to do the testing. Just create a unique email address. We suggest Gmail is a great way to do that because it's nice and simple and, um, and you're good to go. So hopefully Kelly, that answers some of your questions. All right, let's have a look at the next question. I think I've gone too fast, let's have a look. Okay, so Kath in Sydney, Kath says, is there a way Eloqua can ensure we are not over emailing people? Sometimes or something on the canvas that can wait a few hours or a day if the contact has already received an email from us. Great question, Kath. So my response to that is, well, first of all, we need to define what we mean by over emailing, because if somebody's actually asked to receive something, but maybe it meets your exceed your criteria for what that actually means to over email so that's the first thing we need to define now if the person's actually subscribed to various things and that may mean in the context of various campaigns that they get maybe one or two emails a day not every day but on a particular day is that undesirable but keeping in mind again they've actually asked for the content so do you want to withhold that the other thing is you probably want to think through uh, autoresponder emails for instance so if someone fills in a form and you send them an email saying, thank you very much for submitting that detail, et cetera. I would suggest to you that you don't want to factor those emails into the over emailing, because generally speaking, if somebody's submitting in a form and giving you information, then you, they probably have a fair expectation to receive some sort of a confirmation that that submission process has in fact gone through correctly. Now, there are some tools available to help you, certainly dashboards and also some insight reports that could help. So I just want to show you a couple of those to give you a little bit of an idea. If we jump into Insight, uh, in the bottom right-hand corner on the report catalog, you'll see the email tab. 
So from the email tab, you can then go through and look at a whole range of different reports that are available for you to look at. And there are two specific reports, one called email frequency and one called email frequency by month. So the first one shows the number of times contacts have been emailed in the time span selected. And it lets you easily see if you're sending too many emails to a set of contacts. Again, what defines too many? You'll need to look at your own data, obviously, to, uh, to see what that looks like. But I've got a, a sample of those reports here for you so you can have a look. So again, there are two of them, similar data, but just presented a little bit differently. So the first one is email frequency. What is this telling us? So the first column is the number of emails sent. So one, two, three, through to 11 to 25 emails. Then in the time of uh, months and then the number of contacts. So if we look at that very top line, what that's telling us that is in the last three months, 972 people were sent one email. If you go a little bit further down, 1,277 people were sent one email in the last 12 months. And if you go right to the very bottom, which is probably where the concern is, uh, who's been sent 11 to 25 emails, there's been 543 people uh, in the last 12 months who have been sent between 11 and 25 emails. Um, for most of you, uh, actually many of you are quite possibly in that 543 because you're regular user group attendees. So thank you for that. But you typically find when you look at those sort of numbers, it, uh, it's usually people within your own business because you're sending yourself loads of test emails, et cetera. So that's email frequency. The other one to look at is email frequency by month. And so down the left-hand side, we've got August, September, October, November, December, January, February. So being the last, what is that, six months? Again, looking at numbers. Now you'll notice that uh, this is just a screenshot, so I can't click through, but they're all actually hyperlinked. So those numbers you can click on and actually drill in and have a look at who those people are, for example. First of all, I think that's a, a good step to go to because you first of all, really want to identify you know, do we in fact have a problem? Uh, is there a problem? So the next question was uh, from Kath was to understand some options around how we could try and remedy the situation. So I want to show you an example that we actually did this, uh, yeah, this month, earlier this month. So earlier this month, we sent out to a range of customers uh, some details about the upcoming Marquee Awards. And uh, on the day that that campaign went live was also the same day that this user group campaign went live. Now, I know that amongst that group of audience uh, customers that we were wanting to send information about the marquees, they were also user group members. And I thought, well, they don't really need to get two emails from us in one day, which maybe Kath is to your point. So what I did then was simply, you can see on the canvas there, and I've highlighted that particular area, I checked to see, first of all, of the group that I wanted to send the marquee email to, had I already sent them an invitation to the user group? And if I had, I simply put them into a wait step for one day. So essentially waiting 24 hours uh, for them to go through. And that group was reasonably split. I think it was two thirds had been invited to the user group, one third hadn't, roughly speaking. It wasn't super critical uh, that they got the email on that day for the marquees, the following day was fine. Um, just keep in mind that you wanna make sure your campaign start and end dates make sense if you're starting to include these types of things. So that's a good example in a sort of one-off type of campaign. However, when you're running multiple campaigns and you want to ask the question from a um, sort of business process point of view, what you're probably worthwhile doing then is looking at creating some shared filters. So shared filters, remember, I like to refer to shared filters as segmentation on the fly. Pretty much everything that you do in segments or the filter criteria that you're able to apply uh, from a segmentation point of view, you can also build a shared filter, which means you can ask those same questions in the process of the campaign. So from the beginning into the end of the campaign, you can use shared filters to continue to segment the audience as they move through the canvas. And so what we've done here is simply created a loop. And um, let me show you in our instance of Eloqua what that looks like. Okay, so you can see here, I've actually named them, sent three emails in the past 30 days, sent more than three emails in the past seven days. So what that is, it's just, and again, this interface will be familiar to you because it's just like building a segment. So contacts who have been sent at least three emails within the last seven days. 
And so by dropping that as a shared filter onto the canvas, you can then begin to control the flow. But again, if you're going to push people out to maybe it's wait 24 hours or even maybe wait three or four hours, et cetera, um, you just again need to keep in mind your campaign start and end dates. And now it's highly unlikely, but you also need to factor in that it's quite possible that somebody may never in fact get sent the email that you're wanting to push through. Uh, because they may be getting emails from elsewhere and other campaigns may beat you, et cetera. So something for you to think about. But uh, hopefully that answers your question. And the final question uh, was from Samantha in Sydney. And Samantha wants to know, what do I do if I'm not sure that I have consent to communicate with a contact that has been in the database for years? <laughs> That's a good question. I had a discussion with a CMO a few years ago and she said to me, Derek, I've got 30,000 plus contacts sitting in the database and I've got absolutely no idea where they came from. Did someone pick up a USB drive with an Excel spreadsheet and just upload them into the platform? I've got no idea. So uh, yes, there's some work that can certainly be done to help and attribution is a, a big part of that one. But it's quite possibly more of a business process question than it is really a technology question because you know, email addresses don't sort of slip and fall and accidentally arrive in Eloqua. They arrive because of some pretty specific processes. You either manually upload them, which is probably the least desirable, but obviously an option. Um, you may have a CRM integration. And so as soon as there's an email address associated to a lead or a contact in the CRM, they flow straight into Eloqua. Or of course, people may come to your website and fill in some forms. It could be as simple as a contact us form, or it could be that they, like I showed you earlier, wanted to, to subscribe to events. So um, a range of different ways that people can arrive into the platform. So having a really robust opt-in process is probably a really good start. And we've just been through a fairly major project with a client recently, helping them with this exact task. Um, and again, attribution can help answer some of the questions, especially if you've got contacts that are in there from years ago. Uh, we may not be able to historically go back, but we can certainly from today moving forward, make sure that we put some good lead source information into these contacts as they arrive. Of course, if you've got any questions about any of this, please give us a buzz. Um, we do this ourselves all the time. Okay, so uh, I'm just gonna quickly open the Q and A. Uh, let's see, Chloe has a question. In the Eloqua event newsletter subscription button, my email address always unsubscribes automatically. I was wondering if you know why that always happens. Chloe, I'd need to have a look at your individual instance of Eloqua. Can you do me a favor, uh, just as a test, why don't you go ahead, are you able to use a test email account of some sort, so Gmail, Hotmail, something alternative maybe to your work email address, which I wonder is the one that's happening. But yeah, we can go have a chat offline and, and try and figure that one out for you. It just seems there's some process somewhere that's been triggered to do something uh, and probably triggering maybe to do the wrong thing. So uh, let's have a look at that online. Okay, so today's all about re-engagement, win back or reactivation campaigns. There are loads of different names that people give these things. And I'd encourage, well, I'd, I'd suggest that maybe those are slightly different phrases and terminology. Uh, remember the other thing we were trying to do was encouraging Australians and New Zealanders to, uh, and, and, and all of us, wherever you are around the world, to, to try and get back and do some traveling. So this is uh, Phillip Island in Melbourne, which I didn't realize you could do whale watching uh, in Phillip Island in Melbourne. So that's kind of new. Everyone goes to Phillip Island for penguins, but uh, that's kind of cool. Okay, so attribution. So each month we wanted to share with you uh, for this campaign that you've participated in, just to give you an example and show you how attribution can be helpful from a range of different reasons. The number of uh, emails, well, not the number of emails sent, but which emails in the campaign convert people to actually register for today's webinar. So you can see 45% of our uh, registrants came through from the first email, which is the one we sent to customers. And the third one at 9.6% is the first email that is sent to those prospects of ours. So those people who are using Eloqua but may not necessarily be customers of Marketing Q. And so, so far looking at last month and this month, these numbers are pretty similar, but I do find it interesting. The, the second one there at 35.6% uh, 
So that's the second email that goes to people that didn't open the first one, just to see the difference. And then the smaller one of 4.1%, that email is sent to customers who opened the first one, but didn't register for the user group at that time. So kind of like a reminder, last chance sort of email. So again, reinforcing there is merit in making sure that you do some repeats and don't just send one email and expect the world to change. All right. So what does the data tell us? Now, I, I randomly went into four instances of Eloqua and, and gathered some information, which hopefully will underpin that there's definitely a, a good reason for you to be on the webinar with us today. So on the left-hand side, you can see four different Eloqua databases and the total size of those databases. And on the right-hand side, you can see a corresponding number of people who have not been sent an email in the last 12 months. So I don't, I don't know if those numbers are shocking to you or if you're not surprised by that, or maybe that's why you're here because you have a, you've identified something similar uh, in that process. Now, from a commercial point of view and looking down the list of who's with us today, we have uh, some CMO and sort of marketing director folks with us today. Down the right-hand side, that's a commercial thing, right? So you're paying Oracle uh, to store those email accounts in your instance of Eloqua, but you're not actually doing anything with them. So I'll leave that one with you as a bit of thinking music, but, um, but we can <laughs> certainly have a chat about that and how we get these people engaged. And if we can't get them engaged, let's purge them. Let's get them out of the platform um, because the message there is there's uh, potentially a cost saving uh, involved in order for your, your organization. Okay, so let's have a look. The first step to this exercise is uncovering who are the less engaged. So the metrics I used on those numbers that you saw just there a moment ago was essentially first filter was anybody that was not sent an email in the last 12 months, that's the inclusion. Then from that, we excluded anybody that's flagged as a hard bounce back and anybody who is flagged as being globally unsubscribed. So those numbers are reflective of people that we can email, we can send them something, we can talk to them, but for some reason we're not. And uh, that's part of what we're trying to do today. So trying to work out which terminology you're going to use is probably something that we should think about. Are we, are we talking about a win back campaign? Are we talking reactivation? Are we talking re-engagement? The last two I'd argue are probably quite similar. Uh, it's just really vernacular and use of words that you may prefer to use. However, a wing back campaign implies that at some point you had them as a customer. And so now you're trying to win them back. So the thing that you need to think about there is do you have underlying data to confirm that they were in fact once a customer. So they were previously purchasing from you at some point, they've now stopped purchasing from you or specifically that they've gone to a competitor. And so if they've gone to a competitor, do you have some underlying data to tell you that? Because that will then obviously very much shape the type of campaign that you build um, to engage these people. So once you define your audience or how do you define your audience, um, we need to understand who these less engaged are. So what I wanna try and do here is give you some examples of ways that we can uncover this audience. So the first step is to work out less engaged or perhaps not engaged. And let's not confuse um, an inactive email account, which might be you know, a hard bounce uh, with a human who's just not active with your brand. If they're not active with your brand, that's kind of on you, right? That's up to you to try and incentivize them back, understand who they are uh, with targeted comms to try and lift engagement and whatever engagement means uh, from your point of view. Um, now, of course, lead scoring, which is a fully separate discussion than from today, but lead scoring is also one way to help you identify those less engaged because you can use lead scoring from a segmentation point of view, which can be quite helpful if you're trying to trying to isolate that group and understand who that group is. Because as a, you know, as lead scoring says, they might have that right profile, but their engagement is low or potentially non-existent. So that would be a four from a uh, lead score point of view. Now, there is some data available within Eloqua that we probably should start to look at, which will help us understand. And certainly one of the dashboard reports is the contact database health 
dashboard. We'll have a look at that in just a moment. But it sort of helps you get a little bit of an idea as to how big or small this problem is of re-engagement. You know, how many people are there that we really should be trying to reach out to, to re-engage with? And then what defines less engaged? So what we've got here is just some suggestions for you. And as I've said there, that the exclusions are probably just as important as the inclusion. On the right-hand side at the top there, so these are segmentation criteria that you could use. So first of all, identify people who have not been sent an email in X number of months, perhaps not visited your website uh, in X number of months. You may also want to look at not opened an email in X number of months. So slightly different from not sent an email because there will be a group of people that you will have sent comms to, but they're just not opening. And that group of people is probably quite different to the group of people that you've actually not even sent anything to. So you can start to see less engaged. So the first group is probably not engaged at all. And that last one not opened an email is less engaged. There may be website activity though. So you need to kind of balance that out as well. And you can look at that page tagging is probably the most sensible way to view the, uh, the website activity as well. Now the exclusions, as I explained earlier with those numbers that we showed you, we want to make sure that we remove any hard bounce backs and also anyone that's unsubscribed globally. There's no point including those people in the mix because you can't communicate with them anyway. And as a business as usual process, you probably need to think through the idea of actually getting those people out of Eloqua uh, on a fairly regular basis. So maybe it's once a quarter, you clean the database and get those people out because all they're doing is taking up space. And again, from a commercial point of view, there's a dollar uh, attached to having them in Eloqua. So we wanna get them out as much as possible. So let's take a look. I wanna show you some of those dashboards and also just show you in segments how you would actually go about creating some of these criteria so that you can start to filter down and uncover this either less engaged or inactive audience that you're kind of looking at. So when we look at the dashboards, uh, and remember dashboards are available up here in the top right-hand corner of the screen. And we're gonna go down and have a look at contact database health. And in contact database health, it basically gives you an overview of numbers um, and looks at about a 90 day span. Uh, and it gives you the date range right here at the top, but yeah, it's a rolling 90 days. So this is looking at database growth. And for most of you, it's sort of slowly build and sort of uh, head in the right direction. We had some updates and then some uh, removals we had to take care of. Um, next one down is engagement. And this is looking at a few different things. So I tend to remove the send email option, um, but uh, then you can start to look at opens, click-throughs, website visits. And if you hover over these, it'll start to give you numbers uh, as well. Then reachability. So reachability is that group of people that you can actually email. So they're subscribed and they have a valid email address. And then when you get to the very bottom, uh, you've got two large tables. So this one's looking at the overall database and uh, this chart compares the percentages and total amounts of reachable and unreachable. So you can see here our unreachable is at 1455 uh, email accounts and reachable is at 8256. And then of the unreachable, why can't you reach them? Well, you've got bounce backs. Um, you know, I'm really proud to show you that that number is fairly low because we clean and scrub the database fairly regularly. Um, but this group is the trouble group, unfortunately, they're unsubscribed. So, uh, and that could be at an email group level or at a globally unsubscribed level as well. So that's sort of helping you identify the size of what could be a, a target audience for you to, to look at. Now, if we go from there uh, and jump into segments, we can start to see, uh, no, let's have a look at this one here. So what I've done is I've created a, and this will be a little bit different for everybody, but in a nutshell, um, the, the logic that we're about to apply will, apply will be much the same. So what I've got is first of all, in our system, we have targeted both prospects and, account, um, and customers. So it's very easy for us to be able to see which is which uh, as we go through a segmentation point of view. So I thought for the sake of the exercise, 
today I'd focus on prospects. So those are people who are not customers of Marketing Cube, but may well be customers of Oracle. And what I've done is I've added in here, for instance, not visited page tags, and I'm using all the negatives notice because I'm trying to find those people who are not doing anything. So they're, uh, they're not visiting a, a bunch of pages on our website and they've not been sent any emails within the last 12 months. And what I've done here then is also place a, um, a geographical filter over that. And we have a construct in our system called region um, and based on country, um, Eloqua automatically assigns a region to those various contacts. And so it just makes it a lot easier for us instead of having to create a silly list of you know, Australia, New Zealand, Vietnam, Singapore, Thailand, Hong Kong, China, you know, we can just say Asia Pacific, much easier. So, um, and so that list, I get 2,600, nearly 2,700 contacts that meet that criteria. But you'll see also the exclusions. So we have some exclusions that we want to make sure that, so that 26,000, uh, sorry, 2,698 contacts these are people that I can communicate with, but for some reason we're not. So we remove the inactives. We remove people who are globally unsubscribed. Uh, we remove uh, any hard bounces. And we also exclude a range of account types. So in our world, we're not overly interested in competitors, vendors, uh, or customers in this particular context because we're looking to focus on, on uh, prospects. So that's just one way that you can start to drill in. But as a general tip, what I would uh, suggest you do, I'm just going to remove that filter for the moment. Just add a new one. Actually, let me say that. That should go back to zero now. The secret to doing this is to do it incrementally. So by that, I mean, let's do the first one. So first one is uh, actually we want not. So not sent any email and you can come in here and you've got a range of dates that you can play with. Let's say within the last 12 months and then hit save. So each time you add a filter, you want to hit save because you want to look at the size of the particular number that you're dealing with. Okay, this is looking, so this is looking at the entire database. I'll move that up to the top for a minute. Okay, so, but you can see there's, so 5,380 people meet the criteria that's sitting here in the center of the screen, but by the time we take out all the exclusions, then we're left with 1,838. Okay, so then what I might want to do is ask for uh, region information to so find out, whoops, where people are specifically. So if you want to focus on the region of Asia Pac, so in our world, I'd say region, choose the uh, Asia Pacific area and save. So this number should come down, not hugely because Asia Pac is our primary market. So now we're down to 1017. Okay, not submitted any forms. So we can actually, you can say or, and we could say we can make that the same. So looking at different types of engagement last 12 months. So a good thing to do there from a logic point of view is to group them. So holding down the shift key on your keyboard, you can click on those two. And when you do that, actually let me save it. When you do that, you can then group them together as two separate items. Because you see that number is 3887, you watch it bound to change. There we go, I can group them. And so it's or, and, and keeping in mind, remember you just click on the word and that'll change from and to or, etc. Now, if I hit save, that number should change, I think, based on the logic. Yeah, it's changed. So now I'm looking at people who have not been sent an email in 12 months or have not submitted any form within the last 12 months and who are within the Asia Pacific region as defined by Marketing Cube. And so that's essentially one way that you can very quickly begin to find out who this audience is. It does come back to that original point. As I said, though, you really need to think through what are we looking to do here? Are we trying to find people that we're not communicating with or are we looking to try and uncover people who we're communicating with, but they're not responding? So we're looking to re-engage. And that was obviously the premise of the, uh, uh, 
uh, premise of today's topic in the user group. All right. Well, let's jump in and now look at some ideas and strategies that might help you to, uh, to win. Now, this photograph is taken in Western Australia. I just find these on Unsplash, by the way, so they're <laughs> not from my personal library. But yeah, Rottnest Island, a uh, beautiful part of the world. I've never been, I've been to Perth, but have never made it quite out to Rottnest Island. So apparently it's worth going to, and it certainly looks like it's worth going to. Okay, so some of you who have been in digital marketing for some time will probably be very familiar with uh, folks at Return Path. Now, Return Path apparently have renamed their product literally, I believe, only recently. And of course, I can't remember what that is, but the company is still validity. Return Path was their product. The company is validity. And so what these guys do is help around deliverability uh, and helping you understand how to incre increase and improve deliverability. But one of the points they make here, this is from a report of theirs, um, which is email win back programs. Uh, everyone recommends them, but do they really work? And so by the way, the answer is yes, uh, from the report that they've put together. The point they're trying to make here though, is that if you're emailing a lot of people that sort of Gmail, Hotmail, Yahoo, sort of those web-based accounts, a lot of those organizations, as you know, will start to route emails into different tabs and Gmail is a classic for this. You know, they'll, they'll take your email and say to the, the recipient, well, that's spam. And so it goes in a spam folder, or maybe it's an update tab or something like that, et cetera. And a lot of that is based on engagement or lack of engagement with the person sending the emails. So if we're looking to target a group of people that we've not sent emails to for say the last 12 months, we need to factor in and realize that sen simply sending one email does not constitute a re-engagement campaign. Okay, you have going to have to think a little bit further down the track and think about this as a bit of a stage journey or a campaign canvas that delivers a range of uh, communications. And so that's what I wanted to, to help you look at today. And looking through all of these different things and certainly different things I've done over the years, and I'm sure you could all jump in with some suggestions here, but uh, I sort of came down to four strategies to help you tackle this audience. One approach is it's the, you know, it's been a while type of scenario. And, and in that type of a campaign, you might, for instance, you know, ask for specific feedback from people, you know, if they're not engaging with you, don't be afraid to ask questions, right? Use it as a little bit of a testing sample um, to do something. You know, if they, maybe it's worthwhile reminding those people how they came to subscribe in the first place. You know, if we have lead source original type information, let's you know, turn that into something friendly that we can say back to them, uh, for example. And maybe if you've even got time and date stamps, you could even say to them, you know, you've been subscribed to us for four and a half years and hopefully that period has been helpful for you, et cetera. So that's the, it's been a while strategy. Uh, although you could incentivize them as well, right? You have their, have their interest changed and you know, invite them to visit the preference center. And if you've got one, obviously it's worthwhile using it. The cheeky or comedic approach. Now the cheeky or comedic approach I love uh, when it's done well, but I, you really need to know your audience and um, you need to be careful. Uh, and especially if you're dealing your cross-cultural boundaries, uh, you need to be aware that what's funny to you here in Sydney, Australia may not be as quite amusing to someone in Mumbai or in Tokyo or in New York City. So uh, have a little think about that if you're going to go down the cheeky or comedic angle. I did have a really good example from a client that came into me a couple of months ago that I asked them if I could share today. They said yes, but I just have not had the time to go back to them to honestly do that campaign credit and, and, uh, and share the results. But essentially the premise of that, uh, that campaign from their point of view was, you know, happy birthday, Derek. Now, of course, I opened the email because it was not my birthday and I thought, what's going on here? And um, the, the sort of the comedic tone continued and uh, they inferred that uh, my favorite pizza was on order with the anchovies that I love. And then there's sort of a dot, dot, dot. And it's like, well, okay, so it's not your birthday and you don't like anchovies, really safe assumption, I think for most people, but it was great. And so then it was a call to action to you know, confirm some information with them. Uh, I can't remember because it probably wasn't as important to me, but I think they may have been offering some sort of a prize 
um, go in the draw for I kind of we're, we're over iPads and iPods these days, aren't we? I don't know what we give away these days, but yeah. So that was that was really well done. I mean, they completely hook, line, and sinkered me. I absolutely opened that email, and uh, I thought it was quite funny. So um, so that's the cheeky or comedic approach. The panic approach or the FOMO, so fear of missing out, it can work well. It, um, it's probably maybe a little bit more B2C centric. And again, you need to segment your audience. I don't think it's appropriate to look at this audience that you're trying to re-engage with and simply assume a single message is going to work. Um, you probably need to understand that audience first. That's why we talked about segmentation uh, a few moments ago. I think it's really important to understand that list of people and literally look at that list of people, understand their job titles, their job categories, their geography, where are they, their industry, especially in a B2B context. You know, there's quite a bit of information you've got there that you can personalize. But the panic approach is kind of like, you know, maybe it's, it's been a while, is this the end? You know, unless we hear from you, we're probably just gonna remove you from the list, create a bit of fear of missing out, I suppose. Then the final one, which is one I think is worthwhile playing with, and, and perhaps this one comes after you've tried the above three options, is to then nurture them back to engagement and put them into some sort of a campaign that really emphasizes and talks about uh, what it is you do, the value of your organization, potentially to them. Um, these things can be heavily personalized from a dynamic content point of view. Uh, there are loads of different ways that you can potentially play with that. But I think a lot of it will come down to, first of all, will come down to the segmentation. Once you've got your audience in play, then you'll have a better idea as to which approach or which strategy is going to work to help you re-engage that particular group. Now, I did go to a website called reallygoodemails.com uh, to try and find some examples. And uh, trying to find B2B examples is incredibly difficult. Um, so I found these two and they're B2C. So this one I thought was quite cute. Goodbyes are hard was the subject line. Uh, these people are in the framing business. And um, I'll let you read that. You can hopefully read that on screen. But I like the button. The language in the button is wait, keep me on the list. Can't hate the word list, but that's okay. Wait, keep me on the list or keep me subscribed. So the onus is on the person to stay involved. Now, when they click on that, that's a great opportunity to bring them to some sort of a preference center where they can you know, refresh information. Maybe their job titles changed or they've got a promotion or they've got a new responsibility. Therefore, their interest in what you do as a business have changed from their last role. So give them that chance to, to update that information via, via a preference center. Next one, I th it's a little bit different. This is from the New York Times. And if you have a think about it, so what these guys are doing, they're obviously trying to get you to subscribe, right? And so what they'll have is not so much, it's not really a win back campaign per se, or a re-engagement campaign. They're just trying to convert you essentially. So I imagine in their database, they have a huge portion of people who are subscribed to get their free information um, like I am, but then they've obviously got their paid subscribers who obviously get access to a lot more content. And so here they've taken a bit of a FOMO uh, type of approach, sort of, uh, well, you know, a lot of other people, a bit envious, you know, a lot of other people think uh, uh, this is important and we provide great detail, but what about you? Why don't you come and join them sort of exercise? So in your face, the only two things that I think were things missing from both of these two examples was zero personalization. So nothing to address me by name. That's obviously where Eloqua can certainly help you achieve that. Um, and I strongly encourage you to think about that. So some general tips uh, to consider. First of all, consider your voice and tone. So again, we obviously want to make sure we're on brand and not be too silly. So it's probably a good idea to bounce a few ideas off the team uh, as you move through. The use of dynamic content, I think, is, is something that can really help differentiate uh, this, especially as you start to understand that audience uh, and you've segmented that audience and you start to realize that there are some distinct groups or cohorts uh, within that, that segment that need to be spoken to a little bit differently and incentivized differently. Um, GIFs are a great visual way to grab a person's attention. So remember, you can use GIFs in your uh, eloquent emails. Just the only limitation there is really some outlook clients, Outlook, some Outlook email clients don't like GIFs. 
Um, there may be some others, but generally Gmail, Apple Mail, uh, those web-based mails are usually fine from a gift point of view. And I suppose the primary call to action could be as simple as update my preferences, but that means you must have a preference center in which to bring those people to in order to update that information. One suggestion I thought of was to present these people with a highlights reel. So what's a highlights reel? By that, I mean, so if this group hasn't opened anything or in fact been sent anything in the last 12 months, maybe you look over the content that you've shared in the last 12 months and look at what was the most popular and regurgitate that to go back into this email that is targeting these people who are really not engaged with you at the moment. So that highlights real. So this is essentially sharing with them what they've missed out on because they haven't been accessing information. As with any campaign, especially an always on campaign, make sure you have some sort of process in place to evaluate the performance of the campaign so that you can go back and, and take a look at it and make sure it's actually working. Uh, and essentially see these people as an opportunity to get re-engaged. I mean, it's why you're on the call today is you obviously have identified that there's a need within your organization to do this. It's a great opportunity to try something new. And I think that's the point I was trying to make there, you know, try some new content or maybe some innovative approaches. Maybe it's cross channel. It's a little bit, it's maybe it's a little bit of social targeting. Maybe it's uh, uh, mixing things up with, uh, with SMS or, you know, and email, et cetera. There's a few ways that you could play. So if you're trying to think of doing something new, maybe this audience is a good audience to, uh, to experiment on a little bit. So 21A, what's available? So most of you will already be live on the 21A release, except for pods one and two, I think, which uh, moved to 21A this weekend. So uh, let's have a look at what's happening. So uh, um, a few key things to, to understand. The archiving feature is now supported for folders within the email uh, page and forms page. So what that looks like is if I go to uh, go to the email area, you can see the archive listed right here. So if I go into all files and I just open a silly email like this one, um, you can then push that email into archive. Uh, actually, I think you can also just do a right click on them as well. Let's have a look. Yes, you can just do a right click. So you don't have to open it, sorry. You can just do a right click and then move that to the archive. Um, let's take this one. So I click on archive. Archiving an asset makes it unavailable for future use. Are you sure you want to archive? Yes, I am. So that's how you archive an individual um, file. Uh, if I look at... Uh, here we go, I'll take this one. So now what you're able to do is also, well, I can't yet until the weekend, once we've got 21A, but what I'll be able to do is take an actual folder and then archive the entire folder, uh, which is obviously highly desirable. Uh, you don't want to be uh, just archiving individual emails or forms and we'd go crazy. And then of course, once, um, once you've done that process, uh, you'll be able to access them here within the archive area. So I've been waiting for the folder archive feature to come along before I get too excited um, about doing archiving. The, for the admins on the call, if you're looking for some data to show the last login time of users that was available previously, now it's available under the user area. So if you're looking at the user profile in the back end, sort of settings area of Eloqua. Um, when you export the user information, you'll see the last login time as an option uh, if you need to gather that information. Some of you may have had some issues with viewing some of your Eloqua landing pages in Google Chrome. Um, so this fix images function, which uh, as most of you have access to already, but is now for this weekend for pod one and two is this fix images function. So what it does essentially, it fixes the URL to be from HTTP to HTTPS. I haven't seen it yet, but my understanding is once you're in the component library, um, it's a matter of looking at that image and there's like a button that will essentially make that switch for you uh, to HTTPS. Makes it helpful. Then a new one is control form submissions. So 
just as you're able to control the display of a landing page, so you can, as soon as you assign your pretty URL in your domain and save your local landing page, it's now live on the internet and anyone can find it. There is an option to hide it and make it internal only. So you must be logged into Eloqua in order to access that particular landing page. The form works a little bit differently. We don't hide the form on the page, but we essentially mean it enables you to stop anybody submitting that particular form. Now, why would that be helpful? Well, it could be helpful on an event registration page. So if you've absolutely maxed out on uh, registrations for something and you're, you can't take any more, then you can actually you know, control that and turn the form off essentially. You could remove it from the page, but that's probably a little bit clumsy, putting up some sort of a note saying event sold out, uh, probably a little bit more dramatic and a bit more interesting, but you do have that control uh, ability there, which is good. So again, this weekend for pod one and two, then the Redwood branding. So you'll notice uh, various parts of the platform are getting a bit of a cosmetic remake and that's all referred to as the Redwood branding from Oracle. And so that's being expanded to Eloqua dashboards or eight of the dashboards, including the most popular ones, campaign performance and also campaign analysis as well. So all those bits and pieces coming this weekend. We're at 11.57 and uh, we're up to Q&A. So uh, if there are any questions, uh, here we go, Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Uh, what is the suggested frequency of execution for a campaign like this? Once a year, maybe twice? Okay, so great question, Daniel. So Daniel's asking, you know, is there a suggested time frame essentially to run these re-engagement type of campaigns? I think that time frame that you suggested, Daniel, is a good one, but it will differ depending on your business. Now, most people on the call today, not everybody, but most are in a B2B environment, some are B2C. It, it, it probably would depend on the cycle of your sale within your organization. Are you a contract business? Do people renew contracts with you every 12 months? Um, um, you know, how do they buy from you? That's probably a better indicator because because what is lack of engagement if somebody hasn't engaged in 12 months what does that really mean because maybe you only sign contracts every two years so it's not really an indication but yeah i think what you're what you're doing there is good i think what you could also think about doing is uh, making it an always on campaign and so using the segmentation uh filter criteria so that maybe once a week you're asking those questions about that, that qualify people to get into the campaign. And that way it's always on and it's sort of moving through the database versus waiting every six months to do the segmentation and, and make it happen. So an always on type of uh, approach could also be helpful. Thank you, Daniel. Any other questions? All righty, well, we will capture this information and record it, as I said, and have this uh, up on our blog. Uh, we'll stay on the line here for a few more moments. If you do have any other questions, please feel free to ask them. But if not, have a wonderful week and we'll see you online next month. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm.